Okay, great. Uh, you'll, I, I'll apologize if I'm looking sideways. Uh, my, I've got two screens and I'm looking over here to uh, read my uh, text. So uh, sorry if I'm not looking directly at the camera. Um, I would like to begin uh, our gathering today by acknowledging that we are calling in from multiple regions across Ontario, home to the traditional lands of many Indigenous peoples. Uh, we acknowledge that there are 46 treaties and other agreements that cover the territory now called Ontario. I invite us all to take a minute to reflect on the land we are on and the sacrifices that have been made to date to keep these lands. Those of us calling in from Dance Umbrella of Ontario and Nordicity uh, are in Takaranto, Toronto. Our offices recognize and feel honored to work on the sacred and traditional territory, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, as well as First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. The land is covered by Treaty 13, uh, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. We recognize and deeply appreciate uh, their historic connection to this place. Um, we're uh, thankful and very, very grateful uh, to the many uh, supporters and funders that we had, organizations and researchers throughout this work, uh, of whom uh, they are, uh, those people are all in the room today, and, and we're very happy to have, the, have you all here, so thank you. First things, uh, first things first, we'd love to have you introduce yourselves uh, in the chat box. Uh, please share your name, your role in the dance sector and wider cultural sector, if you're not in dance, and your preferred pronouns, as well as the Indigenous lands uh, that you live and work on. Uh, we'll start with the presentation of our report after some introductions. Um, we structured the presentations to recognize that much has changed since uh, this research uh, was started. Um, and uh, carried out earlier uh, in this year. Since releasing the report, we learned about many initiatives from the wider cultural sector that our dance community can make use of to solve some of the challenges we identified. We want to act on our rec own recommendations to prior prioritize community building and collaboration. So we've invited some of our partner network to share uh, what they've been working on to support access to the to cultural space. To our audiences, we encourage you to share any other resources you're aware of in the chat uh, and during the open discussion period at the end. We ask that if you plan to ask a question, uh, you please turn on your camera. Uh, we've got myself, uh, the ED of uh, Dance Umbrella of Ontario. I'm Robert Sobe. And we have three members of the Nordicity team, Peter Lyman, Natasha Holska, and Nikita Gopal, um, uh, presenting today. Uh, P and uh, yeah, that's, there's, our, there's the folks. We've got a panel of culture sector representatives, Karen Tish and Matt Egger from Why Not Theatre, Alex Glass from Arts Build Ontario, Erica Hennebury from the City of Toronto's new Office for Creative Space, and Marilyn DeRossier and Daniela Valencia from Canada Council for the Arts. Yes, and we've also got Ben McIntosh, Manager of Cultural Partnerships from the City of Toronto joining for that part thank, of the discussion. Thank too. you for that, Natalia. Um, we've also got audience consisting of folks who participated in and supported our research along the way, including Ontario's dance artists, facility operators, supporters, funders, educators, and representatives from the wider cultural sector. All right, so without further ado, we'll just kind of kick things off. So here's what we found in our research. Um, and please note, we'll be going through things fairly high level to ensure there's enough time for our panel and discussion period in the end here. Um, but there's tons of detail that can be found in our report document, uh, the supporting appendix document, and some soon to be released fun videos from the Dance and Bellow of Ontario. So take a look at their social media and uh, email communications for that. 
Um, but first things first, uh, looking at Ontario's dance sector, the dance sector is characterized by its dynamic and diverse mix of independent dance artists, nonprofit dance companies, dance presenters, art service organizations, and for-profit dance studios and schools. These stakeholders have different relationships with dance rehearsal space as presented on this slide here. So first, independent dance artists, for example, when surveyed, indicated that they prefer short-term hourly and ad hoc lease terms at facilities located close to the communities they live or work in. Um, and that's because they often participate in the dance sector in a part-time capacity. So accessibility is a, a priority here. Our research also found that dance companies also often prefer to rent rather than own or operate the spaces that they rehearse in, um, but they prefer medium to long-term lease arrangements. And then turning to for-profit dance studios and schools, they more commonly own the spaces they rehearse in or they're tasked with operating the space through long-term agreements. Um, dance companies that own and operate their spaces uh, tend to have increased administration responsibilities. So on top of running their dance companies and running their artistic practice, they manage space upgrades and repairs, uh, facilitate rental application processes and administer rental usages of the space. So in some cases, this additional administrative burden can uh, deter facilities from offering rentals to the wider public, even if space is available, the capacity isn't necessarily there. And then looking at the stock of dance rehearsal spaces in Ontario, we found that the Ontario dance community rehearses in a variety of traditional stu studio, performance, and recreation spaces, as well as some more atypical spaces like church basements, empty warehouses, and outdoor spaces. Um, it's more common for dancers in regional Ontario communities to use uh, more atypical spaces due to a lack of culture specific space stock in these communities. Um, in our research, under 5% of spaces that we identified were purpose built dance rehearsal spaces, which means that they would operate exclusively as dance rehearsal hubs. So this means that the majority of spaces that are used for dance rehearsal are also used for other purposes as well. The median size of rehearsal spaces in Ontario is around 1,000 square feet. So that's on the smaller side and can some, sometimes constrain the scope of dance creation. So for example, these spaces wouldn't be able to accommodate larger dance groups or uh, choreography. So uh, larger rehearsal spaces can typically be found in multi-purpose community facilities and performance venues. And then looking at dance um, ownership and operations, about 53%, uh, more than half of Ontario's dance rehearsal spaces are privately owned or operated with a quarter of registered charities and another 15% that are operated by municipalities. The majority of facilities earn revenue from multiple lines of business, including from offering dance training or dance programs, uh, offering rentals out to the wider dance community or culture sector more widely, um, rentals for fitness uses, events, and other non-dance uses such as film production and the like. Uh, in our research, facility owners uh, noted that the expenses that are most concerning to them to date uh, include expenses on repairs and renovations, insurance, utilities, and pandemic-related sanitation costs. So insurance was said to have more than tripled through the pandemic, but even still, there are many dance facilities that are reluctant to raise their rental rates uh, over concerns that this would prevent community from being able to access their spaces. All right, so on the screen here, we have the clusters of rehearsal spaces in Ontario. So as you can see, there are some clusters located, of course, in Toronto, York Region, and Peel, Kitchener-Waterloo, Burlington, Hamilton, with some activity as well in Niagara, Windsor, Belleville, Kingston, and Ottawa. Ottawa is actually a bit of an anomaly. We were able to find that uh, they have a, a ton of, uh, or not a ton, but at least a quarter of their spaces available were dance-specific rehearsal spaces. Um, we were unable to find many rehearsal spaces in more regional Ontario communities, which could either mean that there's a lack of spaces here or there's challenges with dis the discoverability of existing spaces in these areas. Uh, the average rental rates by city are shown here. So rates are higher in city centers, as you can see, with Toronto there at uh, hefty $47 per hour. Um, however, nonprofit organizations and municipality operated spaces tend to charge lower rental fees per hour. Um, and many spaces do provide variable pricing depending on who's using the space. So the most common price tiers, of course, would be nonprofit uses or commercial uses with the nonprofit users re receiving reduced rates. Um, any facilities that are at uh, educational institutions as well, students would likely receive reduced rates here. And I'll pass it to Nikita to chat a bit about 
the ideal rehearsal space composition. Great, thanks, Natalia. Um, so from our community consultations, we heard that different dance communities have different needs for rehearsal spaces, depending on the structure of their operations, discipline, culture, and other characteristics that impact the creation process. For example, it's, it's common for South Asian and African diasporic dance communities to practice dance without shoes. So smooth Marley flooring is often preferred. Um, this is in contrast to, for example, uh, urban or street dance, who typically perform in sneakers and will need different kinds of flooring that allows them to slide around safely. Some of the key needs that we heard include uh, soundproof spaces that allow for live music, drums, tap dancing, percussive footwork, deep bass sounds, singing, and ceremonial vocals. Spaces of adequate size that allow communities uh, to use different props and materials in their performances um, and rehearse freely. Uh, so that could uh, include spaces that have high ceilings or wing spaces as examples. Um, and finally, fireproofing uh, or smoke allowance that will cater to communities that cleanse the space before a performance uh, by burning different minerals or materials. Moving on to the key challenges for the industry. Uh, our research found that the biggest challenge impacting access to dance rehearsal space is affordability. Despite an availability of spaces, dancers are unable to actually access them because of the cost. Uh, existing dance rehearsal spaces in Ontario are financially out of reach for emerging dance artists and small dance companies, while rising costs are making it difficult for facility operators to stay open. The average rental fee for rehears rehearsal space in Ontario is $42 an hour, which is almost double what artists indicated they could pay. Uh, the issue is unfortunately you know, further magnified by the low income of dance artists. Data shared by the Canada Council for the Arts showed the average median income of an individual dancer was just $15,800. Um, and the review of public grants revealed that there's limited support uh, for financially sustainable operations and, and affordable space rental rates uh, for space operators and owners. Uh, so it's really clear that um, you know, public policy needs to address this issue if the financial accessibility of rehearsal spaces for dancers is to be improved. As well, we found that the accessibility of spaces was also a challenge. Um, so through this research, it was commonly cited that dance rehearsal spaces are often inaccessible in a variety of ways. The first being that they're not discoverable or they're not available at necessary times, which often means evenings and weekends for dancers. Uh, and the second being that they're challenging to commute to uh, and challenging to make use of the critical amenities within them. So we heard that many existing spaces need to need some repair and improvements to be better physically accessible. Um, which was substantiated by our survey findings that repairs and renovation costs were among the most concerning for our facility operators. As mentioned earlier as well, administrative burden can be a bit of a, a barrier on both the dance artist and facility owner side in terms of discoverability and access in that way. So some facility operators have little capacity to manage space rentals even if there is space availability and dance artists sometimes have limited capacity to continually seek out and apply for rental at new spaces and uh, also accessing grant funding to, uh, to be able to access these spaces. So yeah, when we were creating the inventory database of all the culture uh, spaces or rehearsal spaces across Ontario, we found that many rental listings were somewhat vague or not well promoted, um, which could imply that some companies with available rental space may not be widely sharing this news for any of the reasons that we had just uh, mentioned. Uh, so third major barrier um, that we heard was inclusivity. There is a perceived lack of safe rehearsal spaces that can accommodate dancers with diverse needs and culturally diverse practices in Ontario. Um, and when we talk about safety and inclusion, we're referring to physical safety, including managing access to the space through automatic locks and reception stuff, uh, conducting background checks, and ensuring buildings are well maintained with proper flooring and ventilation. Um, we're talking about emotional safety that includes artist run spaces, positive relationships between artists and facility op owners and managers, 
um, and avoiding reliance on atypical spaces like churches that can be traumatizing and inaccessible to uh, Indigenous and to us LGBTQI plus communities. Safety and inclusivity also includes spaces that allow for the practice of non-Eurocentric customs and traditions such as smudging and live drum playing. All right, and to address some of these challenges, the dance sector is increasingly turned to partnerships and collaborative models. Uh, partnerships have been launched successfully with municipal governments, education institutions, the wider culture sector, as well as the wider dance community. So, so we have some examples up on the screen. For example, 44 Gawko is a creative workspace that offers affordable creative spaces through a partnership with Artsville, Ontario, the city of Kitchener and the Accelerator Center. Uh, Alex Glass will be chatting a bit about her initiatives later today. Thanks, Alex. Um, but that is going particularly well. As well, the Ottawa Dance Directive operates out of Arts Court, which is a municipally owned and operated building in Ottawa. Um, Arts Court is running collaboration with a residence steering committee, which works towards uh, making solutions for this space to build a fair and progressive art center. So the committee strives to benefit the collective's best interests of the center and of the culture community. Uh, the resident steering committee is made up of uh, individuals in the wider cultural and creative sectors. Uh, Canada's Ballet Jorgen has been able to secure a long-term arrangement with George Brown College uh, through a mutual agreement by which they administer the dance program there at the school and receive facilities in kind for their dance company. As well, theater and the wider culture sector are great partners. Some members of our dance community have got their starts through residencies at different theaters uh, across the province as well renting uh, spaces as a dance collective allows you to share rental costs and operating responsibilities. So the burden isn't too heavy on any one artist or organization. Based on the key challenges we identified through our research, uh, we developed a set of recommendations to address each of them. The first bucket of recommendations is to rethink public support for dance spaces. This will include introducing dance rehearsal space subsidies and grant programs to support dance artists in accessing the spaces they need for rehearsals without jeopardizing the operational sustainability of facilities. This also includes offering incentives to non-dance facilities with appropriate infrastructure and features to open their space to dance rehearsals. Currently, facility operators do have rentable space available. Uh, but the administrative burden required to rent the space is a barrier preventing operators from doing so. Public incentives could really help address this challenge. Uh, the third recommendation in this bucket is to meet with funders to review funding programs for dance artists and cultural spaces, funding controls, and application processes. To improve discover discoverability, the industry needs a new model to promote and manage rehearsal spaces in Ontario. The recommendation is to pursue a feasibility study to determine the capacity and scale of this model, defining the format, governance, funding for such an incentive initiative. To improve accessibility, public funding programs aimed at, infrast aimed at infrastructure upgrades should prioritize funding upgrades to the physical accessibility of art specific spaces to ensure that the breadth of the dance community is able to access adequate rehearsal spaces. <laughs> Finally, our third bucket of recommendations is focused on prioritizing relationships, collaboration, and community. This can be done by art service organizations playing a more active role in encouraging networking, mentorship, and relationship building amongst different dance communities as well as, as well as dancers and space providers. It will also involve education around cultural and discipline specific uses of rehearsal spaces. Great. Okay, and with all of that in mind, let's open up the floor to our panel to discuss some of the emerging initiatives, solutions and opportunities that are being launched to address access to culture spaces and address some of the challenges that we had just gone through. So each speaker today will provide about a five minute summary of the work they're doing and the resources that they can offer uh, to help the culture sector better access creation spaces. Um, Nikita and I will be keeping time just so that we do have enough time at the end to kind of reflect on everything that we chatted about today and open up the discussion a bit to see if there's any more initiatives we're not aware of or maybe ideate on some new ones moving forward. 
Um, but with all of that said, I'd like to turn it over to Karen and Matt uh, to talk about the Meanwhile Space Network and all the various things that Why Not Theatre has been working on uh, to, to address access to culture spaces. So Karen and Matt, uh, I'll spotlight you as soon as you speak so I can see you and then okay. <laughs> add you right to the top here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, Hello. great. Hello. Um, yeah, so I'm Karen and I'm the executive director of Why Not Theatre. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here with my colleague, Matt. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, we were asked to talk a little bit about Why Not Theatre's space initiative. So I'll briefly outline what we've accomplished to date in this arena and some of our next steps. Our space work actually dates back to 2018, when Why Not hosted a national gathering to examine key challenges facing the theatre sector, and particularly BIPOC and other equity deserving artists. Through this forum, we identified several urgent issues and decided to tackle the question of space. Specifically, we wanted to explore how meanwhile use strategies could be used by artists to address the lack of affordable rehearsal space in Toronto and other Canadian urban centres. So to this end, in 2019, we ran a pilot project in Toronto, whereby we accessed temporarily vacant spaces that were lent to us by the United Church, as well as a community centre in Little Portugal, and a couple of Crescent, Crest Point properties, and turn them into temporary rehearsal halls, which we offer to the arts community free of charge. Over the course of the pilot project, 51 artists were supported, 2,452 hours of free space was given out, and 63% of the participating artists used the savings they accrue accrued to increase artist fees. As well, participating artists reported that they were able to increase their production budgets by 23% as a direct result of being offered free space. In early 2020, we were in the midst of scaling this pilot project to incorporate some larger spaces, including one that was 15,000 square feet, when the initiative sadly had to be paused due to COVID-19. But not wanting to lose the momentum um, that we had gained, why not partnered with the Canadian Urban Institute and School of Cities at U of T on a research project funded generously by the Metcalf Foundation to explore business models for the expansion and replication of our space pilot to more spaces and more cities. This research convened artists, real estate industry professionals, representatives of BIAs and policymakers from different levels of government to explore potential challenges and opportunities related to meanwhile use. From this, in, this research, we generated a report summarizing our findings, which included a market scan of available spaces and examples of successful meanwhile use partnerships from around the world. At the same time, we began advocating to government, beginning with the Canadian Heritage Cultural Spaces Fund to promote meanwhile use as a viable and affordable space model for the community. Not surprisingly, many of the findings from our research project actually echo the findings that you've just heard from the Dance Umbrella study. Artists shared concerns about the lack of affordable rehearsal space and expressed enthusiasm for utilizing meanwhile spaces with the caveat that safety and security, accessibility and equity across racial and economic lines be carefully considered within the model. Real estate industry reps likewise expressed enthusiasm for meanwhile use and interesting enough, were less motivated by opportunities for revenue. Their real interest was around build community building and bringing activity to vacant spaces so as to drive potential interest for long-term tenants. They did voice some concerns about liability, about wear and tear on the spaces, and about compatibility of use with respect to other tenants, so you know, issues like sound bleed. Um, but felt that if they could enter into turnkey licenses rather than long-term leases with a reliable broker, an insurance binder, and flexible termination rates, they'd be willing to participate in a meanwhile use scheme. So over the past number of months, we've continued our R&D process with concentration on building the necessary infrastructure to underpin a, sustain a sustainable long-term meanwhile use program. To this end, we worked with George Brown um, to build a prototype for a digital app that could, would connect artists and nonprofits to vacant spaces and have recently partnered with Stagehand.app in Calgary to continue the development of this app. 
An un unanticipated but productive result of our research was also the emergence of the National Meanwhile Space Network, which is an informal community of practice, which brought together organizations in the arts and broader nonprofit sector that are working on finding affordable space solutions with a focus on meanwhile use strategies. The network was recently launched in October on October 20th, um, and we now have an official website, uh, which compiles much of the research that was, that's been done across the country on meanwhile use. Uh, the network also recently issued a letter to the Minister of Intergovernmental, Intergover excuse me, Intergovernmental Affairs, Infrastructure and Communities, asking for federal support to create an inventory of available government-owned spaces and develop clear pathways to accessing unused government space with a particular focus on heritage properties. And we're happy to report that the network has been generating significant interest and we are um, gradually building the network uh, with an open invitation to any artist, uh, arts organization or nonprofit interested in exploring meanwhile use. I'll now pass the floor just momentarily to Matt to uh, outline a few next steps. Thanks, Karen. Um, I'll get through these last little pieces as quickly as possible so we can get through all the presentations. Uh, firstly, I'll mention that we have uh, recently received confirmation of funding from the Canada Council's Strategic Innovation Fund Cultivate Grants and the Metcalf Foundation to continue our work on the space project, which is extremely exciting. Uh, our plan is to continue research and develop over the next year in preparation for a larger scale pilot project that will extend into 2024. Um, in anticipation of this expanded pilot, we are currently working on completing and testing the matchmaking app that Karen described uh, producing and disseminating educational materials to convince developers and government officials of the benefits of meanwhile use space, uh, developing templates and resource materials for property owners and brokers, including licensing and insurance agreements and community outreach and activation plans, uh, confirming an insurance binder, and sourcing and purchasing equipment for the pilot or a kit, as we call it, including, for example, a uh, projector, projection surface, dance floor, dolly, and roll case, road case to be used uh, across spaces, as well as equipment and furnishings for each space. Um, also, importantly, we will be conducting an accessibility focused consultation process to establish best practices in providing meanwhile space to the disability arts community with the aim of using uh, the resulting input to inform the outfitting, but also selection of spaces. Um, once these tasks have been completed, we'll move into the identifying and confirming the spaces for the pilot and finalize staffing. So if you're interested, we're looking for people. <laughs> uh, I should also mention, we have an upcoming uh, meeting with the Dancer Bell Ontario uh, to discuss synergies between the needs of the local theater and dance communities, because that's so important. We need to get our uh, disciplines together and find opportunities for collaboration. Uh, but that's pretty much it for me. We look forward to sharing our progress with you in the coming months and are happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen and Matt, for sharing. Um, the Meanwhile Space Initiative is definitely addressing a great need that we have in the community. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it to Alex Glass next from Arts Build Ontario to chat about the many things that her organization does to address access to space. Thank you. <clears throat> And good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Alex Glass. I'm the executive director of Arts Build Ontario. Um, and we're an art service organization uh, that's provincially mandated to support creative spaces that are small to medium sized across Ontario. We do research, we offer programs, um, we have ongoing projects, and um, we do some advocacy efforts on a provincial level. Um, so, so I love that you've chosen our Creative Spaces Mentoring Network as an image here because we currently are accepting applications for this program. They're due on November the 25th. Um, and this is one of our core programs that we offer annually to support arts managers undertaking a uh, capital project or a space development. Um, this can be not just bricks and mortar, it can be conceptual as well. Um, and we encourage anybody who is um, you know, facing them or faced with this task to apply. 
Um, it's a great program and we've offered it. This is our ninth year. Um, we're also running it in Calgary too. So if you know anybody in Calgary who would like to participate, please pass it along. Um, another one of our initiatives is um, 44 Golf and Creative Workspace, which was mentioned earlier. This is um, through a partnership with the city of Kitchener and the Accelerator Center um, and us. Uh, we started this six years ago um, in a, uh, <laughs> a Cold War era nuclear bunker-esque building um, that we inherited. And uh, we are just loving it six years on. Um, we are currently at four, uh, full capacity with 30 tenants. Um, we support uh, around 40 community organizations um, through community rentals. Um, and we're just uh, so happy to see the space progressing. One of our other uh, focuses right now is the Indigenous Creative Spaces Project. Um, this is supported by uh, the Department of Canadian Heritage and Canada Council. Um, we're, we're just through our third year, but this project focuses on, on Indigenous communities across the ecology of Ontario, um, uh, which focuses on, um, or includes some, um, it's an iterative process for visioning the future of Indigenous spaces. There's such a lack of them across um, Ontario and uh, we formed a, an advisory circle to help guide all the elements of that project. Um, so right now we're, we're looking forward to uh, releasing, we just sent out an announcement today, uh, New Moon Dialogues, um, which are uh, around topics and themes that have emerged from the project to date, as well as some space-based uh, discussion as well as guidance from the circles, which will be a report that will come out in 2023. And lastly, I'll just mention that we um, also relay to our network um, funding opportunities for creative spaces. So usually these are the Canada Cultural Spaces Fund and uh, the Ontario Trillium Foundation's uh, capital grant. Um, so we are always um, sharing all those opportunities with our network, um, as well as alternative methods of financing your capital projects. So that's it from me for now and what we what we offer. Um, so thank you for having me here today. Thanks so much, Alec. Thanks for joining us uh, and sharing everything that you're up to. Of course, Arts Build is very impactful in Ontario's uh, culture sector, especially with addressing, of course, space challenges. Um, all right. So now I'd like to open the floor to Erica Hennebury and Ben McIntosh from the City of Toronto to chat about what they've been up to to help address the challenges uh, with culture sector spaces uh, in Toronto specifically. Great, and thank you so much for having us. We're so thrilled to be here today and to have supported this uh, incredible study. Uh, it's so great to see some of the, this information coming as a really important baseline to understand what's happening uh, in the sector. Uh, so I'm pretty sure it comes as no surprise to anyone on this call why we needed to establish an office for creative space within the city of Toronto. Uh, access to affordable, sustainable, accessible cultural space has been a key issue for the sector for a really long time now. And I think I would actually argue coming out of the pandemic, it may be the top issue right now that's facing this, that's impacting the sustainability of the city's culture sector. Uh, so we, we recognize we needed to do something differently about how the city supports uh, access to space for artists and creatives. So uh, earlier this year, we established the new Office for Creative Space within the city's Economic Development and Culture Division. This is intended to be a, a one window shop uh, that's uh, going to support artists and cultural organizations with access to space uh, and also advocate for policy interventions that the city can can lead to help uh, Im improve that access. Uh, so it, when we looked at that map earlier uh, in the presentation showing the uh, the, the cost of, of dance spaces across the province, it was no surprise to me that Toronto unfortunately came out at the top. Uh, Space in the city has really been uh, exacerbated by the ongoing development and real estate pressures uh, in Toronto, uh, and that's leading to considerable displacement of, of artists. And we really need to, to reverse that trend, which is why we, we established this office. I'll hand it over to Erica, who's one of our co-leads for the office, to explain a little bit more about what, what we're doing here. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces on this call and so many people kind of in the same room wanting to throw our time and energy behind this. It's really important. Um, so, yeah, uh, 
myself and my colleague Mojan Jinfar, uh, both urban planners with a background in artistic production as well, have uh, been hired by the city to develop this new office for creative space um, with, with Ben and his cultural partnerships team. So we've been plugging away at that since we started um, just this past year uh, in January and fe February, respectively. And we've jumped into uh, you know a million different projects sort of already underway as well as just trying to carve out a long-term strategy for our work uh, within the city in terms of cultural planning and uh, and project-based work. So there are a few different streams of activity that I can kind of share with you that uh, we've d dove in, d dived into, I suppose. Um, uh, the first one is really just supporting artists and arts organizations and trying to find an access space. Um, we will be working on all kinds of different um, partnerships and projects, and we, some of them are underway already. Um, we've got some partnerships, uh, research partnerships going on, and a couple of new projects, uh, a brand new project that we're working on in partnership with Canada Council and Toronto Arts Council, um, trying to do a little bit of uh, kind of an executive summary of all the space analysis work that's been done so far and trying to figure out what those gaps are and share them. And then we're going to be doing a conference in the spring. So I definitely will be um, probably in contact with everyone on this call to try and participate in that conference. It's going to be a national conference on creative space solutions and all the different amazing work people are doing uh, with the particular interest in you know, community ownership and um, um, community land trusts and, and projects like that, uh, but also a lot of um, interest in the really amazing work that groups like uh, Why Not and Akin are doing with the temporary space. So we're looking at uh, that conference as a great big project that's coming up next, as well as all kinds of really other amazing projects like with Arts Build Ontario, with um, Creative Collisions and Trinity Centers Foundation, um, and uh, also the 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 new Toronto uh, Creative Community Land Trust, which is called Creative Cultural Spaces Creative and Cultural Spaces Spaces Trust. Sorry, I always screw up the name. Uh, they're really brand new, and we'll be uh, supporting them uh, as best we can as well. So. Look forward to seeing a website from us soon on some of the other projects that we picked up that the city had already you know, undertaken were a lot of different capital projects with different um, organizations um, sort of at the tail end of the, the current uh, planning framework, which is undergoing really sweeping transformation at the moment um, in, in Ontario that will impact the way that cities uh, are able to negotiate with uh, development for community benefits. So um, we are working on kind of the last few Section 37 um, culture spaces, um, one of which is Blackhurst Cultural Center. There are a number of other uh, projects like that that we're working on. We also manage the Creative Co-Location uh, Facilities Property Tax subclass program. Uh, and we will be also leading the development of a cultural districts program for the city. So we got a lot on our plate. Uh, we're also working on a future Ontario line um, uh, projects with Infrastructure Ontario and Metro Links. Uh, so really some exciting uh, future culture spaces developing through those avenues. Um, and we're also doing uh, some sort of academic partnerships, like we're working with uh, the Social Purpose Real Estate um, Working Group through the School of Cities um, and working on a couple of other research-based projects like that. And we are also really just meeting with artists and arts organizations to just find out where people are at and what they need and how we can support um, so um, please feel free to reach out. Uh, the, the, the recipe for city emails is firstname.lastname at toronto.ca. So if you want to reach out to Ben or myself or Mojan, you can um, send us an email and we'd be really, really happy to hear from you and see how we can support you. So I shall, with that, I shall pass it on. Thanks so much to um, Natalia and Robert for inviting us to be here today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben and Erica, for sharing all of the exciting things uh, that the new Office of Creative Space in the City of Toronto are up to, uh, to address some of the challenges we are chatting about today. All right. And last but not least, we've got Marilyn and Daniela from Canada Council for the Arts to chat a bit about um, models from other cities, uh, what other cities across Canada are doing to address these same challenges, as well as the uh, new innovation fund and how that can be used as a vehicle to support new solutions in this area. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to them. 
Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. It's really, it's really great to hear more about some of the activities. I, we, we met recently with, the, with this group and it's always uh, very interesting to see some of the innovative work that's already ongoing. And really that's what the, the Strategic Innovation Fund is for. This is what it was um, designed to do. It, it's a, a series, a menu, if you wish, of different uh, funding components that are there for um, to help uh, different groups, uh, the sector overall, uh, to try things, to innovate, to uh, come together, build partnerships, collaborations, exchange information, and really try, test, iterate, pilot, assess, and try again, uh, you know, new ways uh, to, uh, to either operate uh, through the art sector um, or to really strengthen, reinforce, rebuild some of the areas that are either more challenging or systemic, systemically, you know, challenged or, or are complex. Um, one, and, and there's, like I said, variety of components. Some of them are meant to really uh, start ideas to allow you to plan, think, research. Others are there to really support iteration, innovation, uh, testing, piloting, uh, and then there's the grow component, obviously, that's there to scale up uh, projects that have already been tested, piloted, and have demonstrated positive impact and have a potential for transformative impact. We still have some digital components that are there to really support organization in their uh, own transformation through digital uh, uh, tools, but also how can we maybe leverage digital technology to solve some of the complex issues? And we heard about some of these tools today. How do we maybe use a technology to facilitate access to space? For example, how do we find uh, in more real time what's available, uh, cost or some other app that might be available? So all of these Components are available for all of you, uh, individuals, groups, organizations, collectives, multi-sectoral collaborations, uh, welcome. Um, and we also have through the fun uh, umbrella, uh, trying to find ourselves a little bit of a different role. So as was uh, alluded to earlier, we started a conversation with some of the larger cities across the country, so Montreal, Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, and we started talking to them because of their direct connection with uh, their communities. Obviously, the cities are uh, already working uh, cross-sectorally, they're already working beyond the art sector, they're connected to developers, they're connected to communities. Um, and so we, we started a series of conversation over the past few months, maybe even a year, to try to see what might be some common issues and how might we work as a collaborative uh, hub for, um, for maybe testing and piloting some solutions in the different cities. And space was the major uh, problem that was common across the country, although there are variations of the problem in the different uh, areas. Um, this was something that everybody agreed that mm, we might want to work on within our own cities, but also together as a, as a network. Uh, so uh, with Erica and her team, with other teams across the other cities, we're kind of working together collaboratively to work on these really unique um, solutions hub solutions work uh, that's ongoing, depending on where the cities. Uh, previous work had uh, has is is at the different cities are at different places, but also connecting these projects through uh, knowledge sharing uh, um, opportunities is either in person. I mean the the annual uh, conference uh, in Toronto will be a great spot for for that uh, conversation to happen. But that's really just to illustrate uh, that we're very keen, very interested in what uh, you're all doing. Uh, that great work in, in whatever other idea uh, you might have, you could come to the fund to, uh, to test it, to pilot it, to, to bring it to, uh, to the team. So uh, maybe, Daniela, you have some additional things to highlight, or maybe there's some links we could put in the chat as well for some more details. 
Sure. Thanks, Marilyn. So I'm newer to joining this, this collaborative work um, that Marilyn has, has mentioned uh, with regards to the partnerships. So I'm really excited to join. Um, in addition to kind of uh, working on the Digital Greenhouse, which is one of the Strategic Innovation Fund components, I will be supporting Marilyn and working with some of you um, that we've heard from on these partnerships. So I just wanted to kind of let you know as well, put my face out there, um, share some resources and some links that I've just dropped into the chat a couple minutes ago about the Innovation Fund, just to reiterate um, what Marilyn said, that it's available, it's there for you. Um, make yourself familiar with the nine strategic areas and what potential projects could uh, be supported through the fund. And more importantly, to, to let you know that you can reach out to us as well. Um, and I've dropped the email in there as well with any any um, specific questions about potential projects or anything else that you feel would be a good fit for the fund, we're here to listen. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Marilyn and, and Daniela. Um, all very interesting initiatives we've heard of today and opportunities to create new initiatives uh, and get them supported perhaps through the Innovation Fund. Um, and with that, I'm just going to turn it to Peter to open up our, our discussion period. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tanya. And hello again, or hello, everyone. Um, uh, you know, I'd just like to start off by saying that. Uh, when we do a project like for Duo, um, we usually obviously have a final report or a session saying this is what the results were and so on. Uh, and this time we thought, well, you know, since we're recommending several things, uh, some are more generic and some are more uh, particular, but we thought uh, um, rather than just present the findings, in a way the findings uh, articulate what uh, what the situation is, but they don't uh, necessarily advance things and coming out with recommendations is great, but we thought that it's, it's, uh, it would be a good thing to convene people together uh, and convene you, this group, which, so we've done that. We realize it's not the first time it's done, it's not gonna be the last time, but so we are, are as a company and as a participant in the arts sector, uh, really like to look toward what next uh, and what next could be done. Now, it's there are a lot of, uh, or there are several initiatives that are well advanced and uh, there's no sense in repeating uh, or uh, trying to duplicate the efforts there. It's really what more, and maybe there's no more, maybe we've got all the initiatives we want and one more is just another one to absorb and maybe it's too many. But before uh, going down that route or concluding there, I thought that we might take a look and see what, uh, uh, what, whether there are any gaps uh, in the measures uh, uh, looked at, whether there are more partnerships and resources that could be put together. So um, that's obviously we're not going to do all of that in today's session, but that's uh, I'd like to use this as a step along the way to, uh, to developing uh, either reinforcing or developing complementary initiatives. So with that, uh, and, and, and just maybe um, you, you might say, well, what are they or where are they? And, and I think there's still a lot of work to be done in communicating to the development community. There's still a lot of work to be done in uh, various financial, uh, uh, creative financial models, uh, and a lot of work to be done in uh, having uh, maybe expanding on the app, maybe the app that uh, the uh, NMSN has developed is, uh, we'll, we'll do it all, maybe it's something ArtsBuild will do it to replace its, uh, its space finder that it had before. So, uh, you know, we're looking to you to at least uh, maybe start to uh, help articulate that. Uh, beyond the perspectives you've all presented. So anybody want to come uh, forward with anything? Just raise your hand a lot. I'm sure we could see it. I guess we can. Uh, we could probably just put it onto the full thing now, I guess. Yeah, I stopped sharing. Let's remove all of these spotlights. Oh, uh, okay. So we have, we have, Ooh. It says Anne Frost. Uh, Anne, we've got Anne. Anne. Yes. Hello. 
<laughs> Go ahead. Um, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, teaching postgrad arts management learners at Humber College recently, I had guests whom I had met from the US whose work is funded by the Mellon Foundation, uh, addressing disaster preparedness for venues and facilities. Um, these folk are available to consult within Canada, again, with the Mellon Foundation funding, but they can't bring any of the funding up here in terms of making it available, you know, for grants or, or for funding for projects. However, their time is compensated for them. So um, one of the two of them is going to attend a conference in Toronto in January. And I uh, wondered if anybody um, was aware in this group of um, work that's being done here uh, in Canada, addressing concerns about the increasing variability of the weather and so on. I mean, I know that that's not directly to do with inventorying spaces and, and uh, locating accessible spaces, but it is a consideration uh, to render those spaces usable after a flood or a fire or an earthquake or a tornado. So I just thought I'd drop that in and would be happy to consult with anybody individually to put them in touch with uh, one of the colleagues from the U.S. who will be present um, in, in Toronto, potentially for a meeting in January. That's it. Thank you, Anne. That's, that's great. Uh, we can, uh, there may even be a invite uh, to the conference that uh, Erica talked about, so or some other way to get, get them involved. Uh, that is a consider definitely a consideration, and unfortunately, probably something within a few years we're going to be talking a lot more about. But who else would like to make a comment on this at this time? All right, I don't know how to raise my hand right now, but I'll, can I chime in? Yes. Um, I think one of the things that's often on my mind is, uh, you know, and I, I'm glad you spoke about this too, but, you know, the, the community building aspect and how interconnected that is to space building. Um, I often think of the difference in the development of the dance ecology um, compared to theatre. Um, and when I think of theatre in Toronto, I mean, I think not only of the way many theaters have grown in relationship you know to venues that they have established but also the way venues are used for um, you know co-production for residencies um, for playwrights and residents companies and residents like the the multitude of re relationships that are established through space and i think we have less of a culture of that um, in dance um, and I think part of that also has to do with just the singularity of dance creation, but um, you know, the, the, the centricity of the choreographer and the way so many companies are about um, you know, the choreographer's vision. And so I think there's a question for me about how to build a kind of ethos around community building. <laughs> um, and the, you know that there are ways of doing that which are not only about space but which are also again about um you know developing relationships across community and developing relationships around many practices again like in dance we have such an extraordinary multiplicity of practices defined by um you know form and identity um, and you know the, the prism of that so just the need for greater knowledge in the community um and greater relationship building in the community. Yeah, no, that's a good point uh, that, um, that looking at it from that point of view, the, the ecology and the infrastructure and the, uh, the practice as well as, uh, you know, the whole ecosystem rather than just uh, uh, the spaces and using space as a way to enhance that as well. So part of the space design. A a anyone else uh, like a comment? We're near the end of our appointed hour and uh, I forgot what the hand signal from Natalia is going to be. Who's closing off here? Is it uh, uh, Robert or you? Or... <laughs> but anybody? We have it on you, but yeah, anyone. If I don't know if anyone has any final uh, ideas or things to share, we can turn to wrapping it up.
Great. Yeah. Let's. Uh, I think Robert, you should uh, finish this. It's it's your dime, so to speak. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you to all our presenters today. Thank you to everybody who attended. Um, we really appreciate your being here. Um, thanks to everybody who worked on this project and supported it and in very, very many ways. Um, and uh, there'll be more information coming out. Uh, Duo's uh, putting out a set of uh, seven videos tied to the recommendations. Keep your eyes out for that. They're kind of fun. Um, and uh, I look forward to continuing this conversation with you and uh, talking more soon. Um, thank you to Nordicity. Thank you to everybody and uh, have a great day. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks Thank so much you. for coming. Bye.